Howdy, and welcome to my second tutorial on shaders in Bevy. This tutorial will cover the basics of getting data into shaders using the bind groups we left empty last time. We'll be starting from the code of last week, which is linked in the description below. Each part of this series will be a separate branch on Git, and I hope this is a good strategy for people. Also, I want to note that the cheat book is currently getting many new chapters specific to rendering, which are covering very different topics from a different perspective, so I recommend reading the new chapters if you want to learn more. First, we need to answer what are bind groups. For our purposes, bind groups and WGPU are a way to get data from the CPU to the graphics card and make it accessible in our shaders. Bind groups are broken into two parts, the bind group layout, which describes the data, and the actual bind group, which holds the data. Let's start with the simplest possible data, a single float. We will add an alpha value to our my material strut and we'll initialize it when we create the quad. Now we need to set up the bind group layout for our data. In our implementation of Material 2D, we have the function that returns the bind group layout, and we left the array of entries empty. Let's create a single entry in that list that will hold our alpha. The type we need here is bind group layout entry, which needs a binding, visibility, type, and count. First, let's set the binding. This is a magic number that will let us track which bind group this layout entry is for, and it will let us get access to the data in our shader. Conventionally, we'll start with 0, and with each entry we'll increment this by 1, so this is binding 0. For visibility, we can set which shader stage has access to this data. We are only using a fragment shader for this series, so we'll set it to only the fragment stage, but you can also set it to the compute and vertex stage if you need. Next, we need the type of the binding. This enum shows us that we can use a buffer, a texture, a texture sampler, or a storage texture. We'll use all of these except storage textures in this video. For now, our data is just a single float, so we'll use a buffer, which works for arbitrary data. Now buffer has a type, which can be uniform or storage. We want our data to be a uniform, so let's use that. Next we have has dynamic offset. To be honest, I haven't worked out what this is for, but all the examples set it to false. There are examples within the engine of it being set true for things like lights, so if you find out you need this, then I've shown you where to set it. Finally, we have the min binding size. You can set this to none, and on my machine, for everything we do in this video, none works. But the docs say the check will be done at draw call time, so it's probably best to set it since we know the size of our buffer. Here we have a rabbit hole to go down though. Since we are moving data from the CPU to the GPU, we need to make sure it's in the correct layout so we can use it in our shaders. A common layout used in graphics is STD140, which basically specifies the alignment and sizing of different pieces of data. It's hard to find a single citation, but somebody on the rendering channel in Bevy's Discord told me that even though WGSL doesn't explicitly say its memory layout is compatible with STD140, they are in fact the same. So all of that tangent builds up to us needing our material to derive as STD140, so we can properly get the size of our data and lay it out in the buffer. Now for the min binding size, we just create a new buffer size with our material's STD140 static size as a U64. Finally, we have a count value. We can use this if we are using an array of buffers or textures. However, we are not, so we'll just set the count to none. Now that we have the layout complete, we can start to create the actual bind group. Remember, we set up the bind group in the render asset prepared asset, and we just return a reference to it in Material 2D. Here we can add our entry to the empty list, and we just need to construct a bind group entry. Once again, we have the binding magic number. It's very important this matches the one we gave in the layout, which for us was zero. And now we need the resource. This is the actual data we'll have in our shader. It comes in the same types as the layout, with some extras to handle arrays. We want a buffer, which needs a buffer binding. Here it's a bit easy to get lost, as the docs will tell you to call create buffer init, but the docs for that say it's not meant to be the main API. Instead, what we want is render device.create buffer with data. The rendering team is actively working on improving the docs, so as Bevy grows, confusion like this should become rarer. Create buffer of data needs a buffer init descriptor, which is a label, contents, and usage. As always, we'll set the label to none, and for the contents, we want our material, which is given to us as the extracted asset, but we want it to be in the STD140 layout. Finally, for usage, we want it to be used as a uniform, 
Here you can see all the different ways that buffers can be used, and you can combine these flags with a bitwise OR. One note is that the Bevy examples adds the copy destination flag for their uniforms. The WGPU docs say this is needed for four specific function calls, but on my machine the code works without it. Reading WGPU source seems to indicate if it was required then there would be errors and panics. And I even found a note in the comments saying that this is implicitly added in some places. Overall, I think it's probably safe to add it and it won't hurt anything, but it's just another point of confusion I ran across while researching this video. I'm in no way a graphics expert, so I'm mainly trying to show you where you can find things like this in WGPU and Bevy, and hoping that if you need these you'll remember how to set them. I'm going to add the flag here to show how to use multiple flags and to be safely in line with Bevy's example code. Now all we need is to set the resource as the entire binding of the buffer, and we have our data on the GPU. Next I'm going to use this data in our WGSL fragment shader. Bevy also has examples for GLSL if you don't want to use the newer language. First, let's create a strut that mirrors our material strut. Then we want to create an instance of this strut that will be the data we just set up in the buffer. This is why it's important to use the std140 layout, so the data perfectly matches what we had in Rust. We need a group and a binding to tell WGSL where to get the data from. For everything we do in prepare asset, the group will be 1, which can be seen from the layout being the second added in the specialized function for material 2D pipeline. and the binding will be the magic number we set on the group and layout. In the actual shader function, we can use the data, and for this example, I'll just set the alpha of the output color we return. Now we have a way to get floats into our shader. This has many uses, but those as always are beyond my scope, and I recommend looking around at things like the book of shaders to get inspiration. One thing we are missing is data that changes every frame, like time. We'll cover that in the next video because it's slightly more complex. There is one wrinkle to this approach though. Often you'll want to send a color to your shader, but unfortunately the built-in color type in Bevy does not implement as std140. So we can use a quick workaround that is used in the example and in the standard material internally. We create a new strut called my material uniform data, which will implement as std140, and then colors in our material would become vec4s in this new strut. Now our layout size is based on the size of the uniform data strut, and in prepare asset we'll create an instance of this strut from the extracted asset, before creating the buffer. Here we can just copy the alpha over, but for the color we'll turn it into a linear RGB F32, and then use N2 to convert it into a VEC4. Now we can create the buffer from the uniform data instance. In the shader we can add the VEC4 color to our material, and multiply our output color by it. Also remember we enabled hot asset reloading for shaders, so we can change the shader code as the game is running. Occasionally this crashes when I'm changing struts, but for the most part it's a comfortable workflow. Let's follow those same steps to add another entry. A common piece of data we want in shaders is textures. We are going to load the awesome face, but the same technique also works for normal maps and any image you want in your shaders. We will follow the same four steps of adding the material to the data, creating the layout entry, creating the bind group, and then adding it to our shader. First, let's add our PNG to the assets folder of our project, and then create a pre-startup system to load the image and save the handle of it in a resource. Also, here's a great time to show off the new DREF derive. It's a great wrapper for resources like this, and it lets us skip having to write dot zero all over the place. Now let's add an image handle to our material, and insert our handle when we create the quad. Next, we need to add an entry to the bind group layout. Actually, we need to add two entries, one for the texture and one for a sampler, which will let us get the texture data in our shader. First, let's add the texture entry. Here we want the binding to be 1, because 0 is still used by our basic data. We want to be able to access this in the fragment shader, so that's the visibility. The type is binding type texture, which needs three values. Multi-sample, which doesn't appear to apply to most images. Texture view dimension, which for images is D2, but you can also have 3D textures. And finally the sample type, which for images will be float, but here are the other options. Float has one parameter, which is filterable. This relates to the sampler we use and will allow the pixels on the image to be interpolated, so it's not what you'd want for pixel art games. Finally, the count is none because we have only one texture, not an array. 
Next, we need to specify the entry for the sample word. This lets us specify exactly how the texture is used in our shader. The sample word will be binding to, it will be visible only to the fragment shader, and it will be of type sample word. And its sample word binding type will be filtering. For pixel art, this should be non-filtering and it should match the filtering set on the texture. And same as before, count is none because this isn't an array. Now for the bind group entries. For the texture, we want to use binding 1, which must match the layout entry. The resource here will be a texture view, which the docs tell us is the data of the texture. And the way to create one is with a texture which we could create using the render device and its data. Unfortunately, this is the wrong path. We don't want to be directly touching the image data. We want Bevy to handle loading and managing the image assets. While researching, I asked on the Discord and was recommended to read the standard material. This example greatly helped with this video because no example in the examples folder use an image in a shader. Here we see the correct approach is to call get image texture on the mesh or mesh 2D pipeline remembering that the 3D variance of all of this is basically just removing 2D from every name. We get the Mesh 2D pipeline from the Material 2D pipeline resource we found last episode, and that is added by the Material 2D plugin. Now this function needs a hash map of image handles to images as render assets, and it also needs a handle to an image. This hash map type is unfortunate, but if we look at the source code, the type is render assets of the type image. This is the render world variant of assets, and it contains everything we've loaded in render asset form. As a quick exercise through the engine, let's see where these come from. We start at the render asset plugin, and we see it init's our render asset resource. Next, we see a system running in the extract stage called extract render assets. If you want to know more about stages, the new chapter in the cheat book will help you understand them, and we'll cover them more next episode. Extract is the stage that crosses between the main world and the render world. Here we see all the loaded assets getting detected and then extract asset is called on them. This is the same function we wrote for our material. There's also a prepare asset system which calls the prepare asset function like the one we wrote and it puts the assets into the render asset resource. Finally, let's find out how this system was added for our images. The image plugin adds the render asset plugin for the type image, and then this is added by the render plugin, which is finally added by the default plugins. This was a bit of a tangent, but I think it's interesting to show how the engine is written in the same ECS style as our projects, and I hope you saw a little of how they chose to architecture things and write systems. I also think it was interesting to see how the code we implement is tying back into the engine. All of that tangent ended up with us adding the render assets resource to our params list. Now for get image texture, we can give it the images resource and our image handle, which we know is the same as the one that we would use in the main world. All of this saves us from creating a sample or in texture view, which are delicate structures holding things like the byte layout of the texture. If you want to see how much work Bevy is saving us, I'd recommend scrolling through the textures and bind groups chapter of Learn WGPU. We also have the interesting problem of assets being loaded asynchronously, so we won't have our textures on the first frame. Thankfully, we can return a prepare asset error from this function. Currently, the only error is retry next update, which is exactly what we want. If our texture isn't loaded, then get image texture will return none, and we can return the extracted asset back to the engine to try again later. In practice, this happens for about 10 frames on my machine. Now all we need to do is add the two entries with their resources and the correct binding numbers. Finally, we can get the texture in our shader. We are still in group 1, but now we are bindings 1 and 2. Our texture is type texture2d of f32 because of how we set up the layout entry. And our sampler is type sampler. Now to use the texture, we call the built-in function texture sample with our texture, the sampler, and the location to sample. For us, the location is given by the UV coordinate, and we'll multiply that by the output color. Now when we play the game, we can see our transparent colored face. From here, there's a lot more you can do with shaders, and I recommend trying things out on your own. At this point, the Befi physically-based rendering material should be understandable, and is a good example of how to use this for your own materials. We followed the same code idioms in this video. In the next video, we'll look at specialization and start building to getting time in our shaders.
but that video might take a little while. Also, I started a Patreon and I'm linking it in the description. Some great people on the Discord have already signed up without me really advertising it, and I'm really grateful to them. This has been a wild ride so far, and I really appreciate all the nice people I've got to meet along the way. As always, remember to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.